Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about scientists serving as advisors to presidents, governors, members of Congress, prime ministers, and so on. Uh, it's a tough job, especially these days, in the political, in the violent political, volatile political environment that the nation faces at the present time. Let me give you some examples. A few days ago, Governor Perry, running for the presidency on the Republican ticket, said this. Scientists have cooked up the data on global warming for the cash. In his stump speech, Perry referenced that a number of scientists who have manipulated data so that they will have dollars rolling into their projects. John Huntsman, another Republican candidate uh, for president, said this just about the same time. When we take a position that isn't, that isn't willing to embrace evolution, when we take a position that basically runs counter to what 98 out of 100 sci climate scientists have said, what the National Academies of Science have said about what is causing climate change and man's contribution to it, I think we find ourselves on the wrong side of science and therefore in a losing position. Presidential candidate uh, Michelle Bachman said this on the floor of Congress. We don't have anything to worry about because carbon dioxide is a natu natural byproduct of nature. <laughs> well, Governor Mitt Romney responded similarly to, to, to John, Hunt, John Hunts, Hunt, Huntsman's comments about humans being responsible for climate warming. So you see, that is the nature of, of discourse today in politics. And that is the environment that scientists have to provide advice. <clears throat> in this uh, tough environment, more than ever before, policymakers in government and the private sector must deal with new issues that have a basis in science and technology. Some 50% of the new legislation introduced in Congress each year has a scientific or technological component. Let me give you some examples of, of the kinds of uh, decisions that public officials face where scientists are called upon to provide advice. Should the United States develop a hydrogen bomb? Is global warming a serious threat? Is the strange disease, this is in the early 1980s, is the strange disease affecting gay people anything to worry about? Are genetically modified foods safe? Is it necessary to protect all endangered species? Did any of you notice on Woodneck Beach a couple of weeks ago a wire fence that was temporarily put up because a plover had a, had a nest there and, uh, and this fence was put up to protect, to protect this, this, uh, this, uh, these two little birds and their egg that they were hatching? I thought that was just great, for, not only for the species, but for public education. Was I the only one that saw it? You, some of you must have seen it. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Another example, in, in England, there was a risk of eating beef because of mad cow disease. I'll discuss that case with you. In each of these cases, I will tell you what my own opinion. Was, was this good advice or was it bad advice? And I'll tell you why. Is the ozone hole at the top of the atmosphere caused by the refrigerant, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs? Well, how is this advice to be provided? By whom? To what extent should science or politics determine the outcomes? What are some of the pitfalls facing scientists who provide this advice? How can scientists serve as advisors with integrity in the face of their own values? They have personal biases, they have possible conflicts of interest, and if the scientific data are incomplete. So as I said before, I will discuss, I, give you, I will respond to these questions, tell you how the work is done, uh, by giving you examples, actual examples, instead of going into the philosophy and the epistemology of, of providing this kind of advice. But I'd like to begin by sharing with you the views of four well-known observers, all non-scientists, about science advice. First, the newspaper editorialist David Broder, 
of the Washington Post. He wrote on the subject, and this is what he said. It would be nice to say that experts should make these decisions, but the costs are so high and the consequences so large that if there is to be accountability in a democratic society, politicians answerable to the public must make the final judgment. I think he was right. Uh, in the same newspaper, commentator George Wills wrote, there is a lesson to, in today's constellation of news stories about how to read a newspaper. Pay at least as much attention to science news as political news. Political choices are made in contexts that politicians cannot choose, and the contexts are increasingly shaped by science. And then the well-known American social commentator and pollster Daniel Yankelevich wrote an essay, and he called it, You Can Argue with Einstein, by which he meant we ought not believe everything scientists tell us about the issues outside of their field. And he offered several examples of how severely limited a learned person's experience may be. And he concluded, we have come to learn that experts, however impressive their credentials, often do, often do not have equal grasp on all modes of knowing. I want to give you an example of that. Uh, when I was president of the National Academy of Sciences at, at our annual meeting, William Shockley raised his hand and wanted to say something. Shockley was the co-inventor of the transistor, a Nobel Prize winner. And this is what he said. I believe that people of African descent have lower intelligence than Caucasians because their brain volumes are less. Nobel Prize winner. He was wrong on both accounts, <laughs> that the brain volume was smaller or large, but also that there's any connection with brain volume and intelligence. Look at the brain of an elephant. <laughs> and then there's Winston, Churnal, Chur, <laughs> Winston Churchill's famous remark, <clears throat> experts should be on tap, but never on top. <laughs> now, how is Churchill to know that the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, had a graduate degree in chemistry and that she reached the top? Former British ambassador to the United Nations, Sir Crispin Tickell, wrote the following in the magazine, The New Scientist. And this is what he said. Scientists should be much braver. This argument, whether sh should, wh this argument, wh should scientists speak or should not, is a lot of crap. It's just the word he used. Scientists cannot promise more certainty than economists can when they recommend changes in taxes or interest rates. Uncertainty is part of the human condition. Caution by scientists may, in reality, be recklessness. We must always look at the cost of doing nothing. I also agree with him. Well, these are important views to keep in mind. However, my own view is that many of the decisions made today require such technical understanding by a president, a prime minister, a member of Congress, that they would be well served to hear what, their, what scientists believe about the issue that they're concerned with before making their political decision. <clears throat> Providing scientific advice to a, an important official is not without its risks. Many, many, on many occasions, the data are incomplete. We don't have all of the information we need to make a decision. And there are crisis situations where default judgments are needed. That is where decisions must be made and there is no time for more research. In this case, I would prefer to assemble the judgments of the most qualified experts in the field. Let me give you an example. When I was uh, serving in the White House, uh, one of our satellites that are in space to, to look for nuclear explosions uh, uh, set off by other countries detected a flash coming from somewhere in the Indian Ocean. And I had to put together a committee to see whether or not this was actually the case, because the suspicion was that this was a nuclear test by the Israelis and the South Africans, a clandestine test that they wanted nobody to know about, so they went to some remote place in the Indian Ocean and tested their weapon. I put together a committee of 
uh, outstanding people, all with government clearances, all who knew the technology of these satellites, and they concluded that this was a spurious detection, that it was in the instrument and not an actual event. Some journalists immediately criticized this uh, committee of mine, calling it a conspiracy to protect Israel. You see what they were faced with. Perhaps, uh, as I mentioned this before, the major difficulty in providing scientific advice is that scientists, like everyone else, have their own values. <clears throat> and the greater the uncertainty and the lack of data, the more they may rely on their personal values in making judgments. In such situations, it's worth remembering the advice of Lord May, a former president of the Royal Society. The role of science is not to impose values, but to delineate choices. And then there's the other issue of C. P. Snows, the British uh, uh, government official and author, which he called the two cultures in the corridors of power. Do you remember that? He served in Whitehall uh, as a government official, and he found that when he wasn't speaking to scientists who were serving the government, nobody else understood him. And the other way around, he didn't understand what the, uh, what the, his, the economists, the financial people, the lawyers, and so on uh, were, were, were talking about. Well, I was fortunate in serving as, as an assistant to President Carter, who may have been the most technically literate president since Thomas Jefferson. <clears throat> However, the other senior advisors in the White House, who all of whom were important in decision-making, were ill-tutored in the way scientists think and work, in the scientific method, in the nature of the role of probability and uncertainty in science. Some of them wondered why the president needed a science advisor. Initially, they thought that I was just there to represent the scientists, like there, there are people in the White House who represent the vet veterans, the, different, the environmentalists, and so on. I was there to help the president succeed, not, not to, to represent a, a political body on the outside. There is a way, let me tell you a funny story which illustrates what I, what I have in mind. President Carter had a meeting of his staff every morning at 7 a.m. in the Roosevelt Room of the White House. The Roosevelt Room is a long, narrow room with a long, narrow table. The president sits at one end and the senior staff drape around the table when they come in at the other end. <clears throat> well, the president comes in, we're all there, and he calls out, from the other end of the table. Frank, I see, in today's, in, I see in today's New York Times that there are too few neutrinos coming from the sun. What do you make of it? <laughs> Here I was, 7 a.m., I got up at 5.30 for my run on Wisconsin Avenue, a quick cup of coffee and running down to be on time for the seven o'clock meeting. So I said, I don't know, Mr. President, maybe neutrinos have mass, we'll see. And then he said, keep me informed. I want to know what happens. <laughs> well, the president, you know, the way it works, the president talks about what he thinks is important that morning, and he leaves, and the chief of staff takes over the meeting. As Soon as he's out of the room, they all run up to me. Frank, is this a crisis? <laughs> Should we send cables to all of our embassies? And the national security advisor said, Should I get Air Force One? Air Force One to warm up. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, every president since Roosevelt, from Pre Roosevelt to Obama, had a science advisor. Nixon fired his. He didn't like the advice he was getting, but also he didn't like the way the advisors on his science advisory committee were criticizing him on the outside. He had a point there. <laughs> so he got rid of him. And what happened was Congress said, no, the president has to have a science advisor, whether he likes it or not. So they legislated a new office called the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and they put it in the White House. And they gave the, the guy who was heading that office a very high salary and the rank of a, of a there, are, there are different ranks in the federal service. Number one, which is a cabinet office, and number two, you're a deputy secretary of defense or something like that. And so here, here's this office that the president didn't want, suddenly there, uh, that he has to accept, or he could veto it. 
Well, that was, Ford was the president and Rockefeller was the vice president and Rockefeller said, sign it, sign it. It's the least trouble you'll have. Well, he signed it. The legislation, in a sense, did put a science, scientist in the White House, but it gave him a lot of problems as well. He was the highest paid person in the White House after the vice president. <laughs> that was Congress. He had to be confirmed by the Senate. That was not good. Because the science, you see why, if you're confirmed by the Senate, you have to testify whenever they call upon you to testify. And no member of the president's staff goes up to Congress to testify and tell them what the president is thinking about. And so that's another. So, so I could have had an office in the White House, but it was in the executive office building across the street just for that. Uh, I, would, I don't want to call it a blunder, but because they had a worthy cause in mind. In any case, uh, uh, that office exists until today, and, that, uh, and the president has both a science advisor who now serves also as director of this Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I want to tell you the way I got involved in all of this. I was at MIT, uh, chairman of a great department, having a great time, when one day I received a telephone call from the president's secretary. Frank, the president wants to see you tomorrow morning. She called me Frank because I knew her from the Kennedy administration, and, and we, you know, we got along pretty well. And why does the president want to see me? Well, he didn't have a science advisor, so it had to be that. So I, you know, coming from Cambridge, where most of the science advisors to presidents come from, <laughs> uh, I was prepared. I prepared myself. I was prepared for the uh, the meeting. Um, so I, I show up the next morning, I'm ushered into the Oval Office, coffee and nice general chatter and so on. And then C President Carter says, I want, to, I want you to be my science advisor, and I hope you will accept. And so I said, yes, Mr. President, that's a great honor, but I have some questions to ask you. What access will I have to you? Can I call you directly, or do I have to call through your chief of staff? He gave a good answer. He said, <coughs> there are 50 people in Washington who could call me directly, and you're one of them. That, sound, that was good. <laughs> then I said, I want to attend all of the cabinet meetings, not as a member of the cabinet, but to sit there in the room as your other most senior staff members do. He said, yes. And then I said, I want to be on the National Security Council. He said, no. <laughs> You're not the chief joint, not a member, of, you're not the joint chief of staff of the military, you're not a cabinet officer, you're not the head of the CIA, no. But if there's a technical issue that comes up, you will be invited to come. And that happened twice in the time that I was there. And so at one time when I was there, there was a discussion and so on. And Carter asked for a show of hands on a particular issue. It was classified an issue. And everybody voted for it except I said no. And the head of the CIA also said no. Uh, and uh, afterwards, the president took me aside and said, you were technically correct, but I couldn't do it. I have to go the other way because of political reasons. That was fair enough. I did say I want to be involved with the selection of all the principal scientists in each department of government, like the head of NASA, the head of National Science Foundation, and so on. He said yes to that. And that was, that, that was great. Now Carter used, President Carter <laughs> used me in, in a novel way that no science advisor had ever been used before. He sent me on special missions to brief heads of government without any publicity. So I, I was sent to brief Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, at number 10 Downing Street. And uh, that was a very interesting experience. If there's time in the q and A, I'll tell you why it was interesting. But he also sent me to brief the head of the Chinese government, Deng Xiaoping. He said, I want you to take a White House plane. You know, these are the planes which say United States of America across them. And I want you to take the head of the National Science Foundation, the head of the National Institutes of Health, the chief scientists in the energy department, the chief scientists in agriculture, and so on with you. And I want each of them to have something to offer the Chinese where that would help the Chinese in their own development. And so, uh, I mean, that is a high power delegation. There's been nothing like it since. 
And so we arrived in Beijing, and when the Chinese saw this plane and the people on it, they immediately ushered us in to see Deng Xiaoping, the, the head of the government. Um, <clears throat> the reason for this attention to the Chinese is this. The Chinese ha had, uh, were in a, their relations with the Russians at that time were going down because the Russians refused to give them the technology to develop a nuclear bomb. The Russians did the right thing in, do <laughs> in that, nevertheless. <clears throat> And so, uh, so the, uh, our national security advisor, the president, the Ch secretary of state, this is an opportunity for us to get the Chinese to, to partner with us in a lot of international things. Instead of having that, the Russians and the Chinese in the world working together, which would be a dominant force, we would split that. And this is something in our interest. So let's send a group there that will entice them, that will interest them in working with us. Uh, president Carter, wrote about this in his book that he published a year and a half ago. And this is what he said in the book. He said, Frank Press called me and got me out of bed. Now, do you know what it means to call a president and get through at any time of day, but to get him out of bed? I mean, that is special. And I said, but he took the call. Mr. President, Deng Xiaoping wants to send 5,000 students to America instead of the 500 students that you, that you authorized us, what shall I tell him? He says, Frank, tell him yes, tell him yes. And in the book he says, these 500 students grew to 300,000 Chinese students that have been here, were educated here, and then half of them went back to China and half of them stayed here. He sent me with a letter to deliver to the Prime Minister of Japan. This is what the letter said, I'm, uh, in polite diplomatic language. You guys are stealing our science and you're not doing anything in basic research to replenish the bank account. If you want to use this technology, you should do, you, we should share it. We'll share our science with you. We publish all of this stuff and we want you to do the same. Uh, that was an eye-opener for the Japanese Prime Minister. Well, let me go now to who provides more to, um, let me discuss more about who provides this advice. I mentioned the president of the National Academy of Sciences, the president's science advisor. But let's go back to the academy. I think you must know that President Lincoln uh, officially uh, established this advisory group to the government, and he did it in an unusual way. You're not going to be part of the government. We're not going to pay you any money other than your expenses. And we want you to, uh, to uh, respond to us when we ask for your advice. Well, that has grown today to the level of providing 200 reports to Congress or to the executive branch of the government each year. The Academy now has some 1,500 employees. It now consists of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine. It has been called the most influential advisory group in the world. And it's a role model for other sovereign academies, for example, the Royal Society, founded by Isaac Newton, uh, to, to follow our academy's uh, position of advising the government when called upon and providing the best scientific advice possible. There are other examples of scientific advisors. Uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard University, it's a source of many high-level government officials. Um, <clears throat> They, they uh, in the reports that they did with their own funds and in other ways, they, they contribute in providing scientific advice. The MIT Business School, the Sloan School, is another example uh, of, of universities. And then the professional societies all offer to help the government when necessary. And then there are the interest groups, the Env Environmental Defense Fund, the American Medical Association, and so on. Okay, with that as a background, let me go into some case histories. I think the most important science advice to any government official anywhere in the world was a letter three sentences long that Albert Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt. And this is what he said. We believe that the Germans are in the process of developing an atom bomb, and because Germany might be doing so, we should do the same. 
think of the Nazis with an atom bomb. It's like putting a meat axe in the hands of a psychopath. In this case, the consequences were so grave that it was not a question of whether it could be done or not, how much money it would cost. The Manhattan Project was started for the Americans to develop a nuclear weapon, an atom bomb. So that advice was successful, it was important, and, and well done. President Truman's decision to make a hydrogen bomb, you know a hydrogen bomb is 10, 15 times more powerful than, than an atom bomb. A group of scientists that worked on the atom bomb, led by Oppenheimer, urged President Roosevelt to work with the Soviet Union to share the knowledge and for both to agree not to develop this weapon. There was uncertainty about the feasibility of doing it, but what entered here were the value judgments of scientists, of, of the scientists who built the atom bomb. On, they didn't want to see a new arms race with terrible new weapons of mass destruction, so they proposed to uh, cooperate and work with the Russians and sign a mutual agreement not to do, develop this weapon. President Truman invited them to the White House to present their point of view. They didn't know that he had already made up his mind before the scientists even came in to, to brief him to build this weapon. I believe he made the right decision and the scientists were wrong. And this was confirmed by the subsequent history that emerged after Stalin died. Sakharov, the chief scientist in building the Russian nuclear weapon, was debriefed and he said in his mind, he, he was almost certain that no matter what kind of agreement uh, the, we had signed with the Russians, the Russians would have clandestinely gone ahead to build this weapon. Historians have since found in the minutes of the Politburo and in, the, in addition to the debriefing of Sakharov that Stalin indeed would have gone ahead to, to develop this weapon. Well, the world would be a different place today if only one nation had this, uh, this, this super weapon. Now, I knew several of the American scientists involved. One of them taught me nuclear physics at Columbia University. They were wise, experienced, and dedicated to peace. But they let their personal values enter into what should have been purely technical advice. Could we build this weapon or not? How much would it cost? And so on. And I think of this a lot these days because if I were old enough at that time, I probably would have been inclined to join them in what hindsight reveals to have been a flawed decision in a matter of the highest uh, importance. Another, another case history, the AIDS epidemic. In the early 1980s, when, AIDS, when the AIDS virus just uh, first appeared, there were a small number of cases afflicting the gay population mostly in New York and San Francisco. Prejudice and scientific ignorance led to a policy of benign neglect. Nobody cares about these people, that sort of attitude. Well, as data accumulated, researchers and clinicians across the country became worried about the unusual symptoms of this strange disease. And as president of the academy, I began getting calls from scientists all over the country who said, the AIDS epidemic is more severe than government is letting on. We're detecting it in the heterosexual population in the large cities and small cities across the country. It's going to spread rapidly unless something is done. The academy has to do something about it. So with this advice from many of our most distinguished scientists, I went to a senior official in the government and said, you must really ask the National Academy of Sciences to examine this problem because we think it's going to be serious more dangerous than the public realizes. The response of the official was, stay out of it, you'll only create mass hysteria. Well, being independent of the government, we did it anyway, we used our own funds. We created a blue ribbon panel of the leading clinician, clinicians, virologists, molecular biologists, immunologists, and epidemiologists. They produced a report in six months, which is very fast for the academy. The report had national impact. It was, had hard-hitting recommendations uh, by a, a group of experts uh, who, had, uh, who, who had name recognition and who had distinguished records. President Reagan immediately created a special commission reporting directly to him. 
He put the chief of, of naval operations, just retired, in charge of it. He put a gay person on this commission. The budget for AIDS was tripled, but most important, a nationwide education program was started to inform the public about how AIDS is transmitted. <clears throat> I think this was probably the most important public service of the National Academy of Sciences in its 140-year history. <clears throat> Another example, the debate about under, uh, the space station. There was a big debate about whether uh, the United States should construct a space station. It's up there right now. Uh, and uh, this occurred in the early 1900s. It, 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 it triggered a, a, a high degree of interest on the part of scientists all over the country. Hundreds of thousands of physicists, chemists, biologists, and earth scientists working through their professional societies mounted a campaign to defeat the authorization of the space station. Their point was, no useful science could be done there. It's just, to, you know, just to get up there, but not doing anything useful. And they were right, in my opinion. There was little new scientific results that would would result from the space station. A very expensive uh, investment indeed. Well, despite the prestige of these science organizations, Congress overwhelmingly approved the space station against the advice of the scientists. A congressman I knew, George Brown, from Southern California, a great friend of science, asked me to come see him. And as soon as I walked in, he said, we taught you guys a lesson. You have to understand that the space station is a national commitment by the president and the Congress, a decision to maintain a human presence in space. It fosters international cooperation. It creates jobs at a time of diminishing defense budgets. We want to do this for the country, for the world. We're not doing this for science. So sometimes providing technical, technical advice requires an awareness of the economic and political dimensions of a problem beyond its scientific or technological rationale. The ozone layer. The ozone layer is a layer at the top of our atmosphere which uh, filters out ultraviolet light. Without the ozone layer, life may not have been possible on this planet because the ultraviolet light causes cancer, destroys crops, uh, does many bad things. <clears throat> Three scientists shared the Nobel Prize for discovering that the common refrigerant, the chemical that's in all of your refrigerators, these chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, was beginning to destroy the ozone layer. <clears throat> well, 10 years later, it took them that long, an international agreement was signed stopping the release of CFCs into the atmosphere. This is an open and shut case, an outstanding example of an indisputable, indisputable scientific evidence leading to an international-based, science-based agreement, treaty, that phased out of production all of the CFCs. A great example. Mad cow disease. In the 1980s, the British government told the British people that beef is safe to eat. They said we had a science committee that we uh, put together and they told us uh, that this was the case. Then in 1996, the government reversed itself and announced to a dismayed public that a number of recent deaths from a neurodegenerative disease was probably caused by mad cow disease. What went wrong? Well, the committee that they appointed that gave them this advice was too well connected. They were all friends with the government officials that, that, uh, that they were supposed to advise. The committee was small, but it had some very famous people, all, all knighted, all Sir so-and-so, Sir so-and-so, Sir Professor so-and-so. And the committee was denied access to all the data that was available to the government. The committee was pressured to act quickly and became over-dependent on draft materials provided by the government. And under pressure, the committee dropped a key sentence from the report that indicated there that there was some risk because the government official said it was inflammatory. Well, this is a prime example of a co-opted advisory committee incapable of providing independent advice. <clears throat> so that was a failure. 
here's a great success, the regulation of recombinant DNA. In February 1975, scientists organized a conference in Asilomar, California, to discuss public policy safety aspects of the then new field of recombinant DNA, the basis of modern biotechnology. <clears throat> This was an important event in the history of science. The scientists who discovered this new technology proposed a voluntary moratorium on certain types of recombinant DNA experiments to ensure the safety of the public. Well, the leading experts were assembled and they agreed to a voluntary self-imposed proscriptions on certain kinds of research. The government issued regulations after the early warning by the scientists. And what happened, as they learned more about it, the severity of the regulations, based on scientific advice, uh, was, uh, was reduced. And it became, and, and recombinant DNA became a very important industry in the United States. <clears throat> I mentioned global climate change before. <clears throat> I want to bring it back for one reason. At the present time, 74% of the Senate and 53% of House Republicans deny validity of climate change. And as Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma, he called it the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. On the other hand, nine out of 10 world experts in climate science believe that global warming uh, to be a, a very dangerous uh, uh, possibility as we approach 2050. The, pres the presidents of the world's leading science academies, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Japan, Russia, India, Germany, Brazil, called for a 50% reduction of CO2 emissions. <clears throat> Is climate change a proven theory? No. Uh, in fact, no theory can ever be proven right. It can only be falsified. <clears throat> but uh, explain this to a member of Congress. Well, with this in mind, uh, and with the supermajority of qualified scientists and pressure from other countries, President Obama had uh, wanted to submit legislation for climate change, but he, ch but he changed his mind. He simply said, this will never pass this Congress, and uh, there's no use even trying. What happens is that the fact that the Americans will not participate means that a global agreement to uh, address climate change without the US is impossible. And so no meaningful treaty will emerge as long as the Americans take this position. I would like to talk about the relations of, science, of a science advisor to his climate. What does a science advisor do if the client adopts policies contrary to this advice? Should he or she resign if this happens? I hope not, because if, with this attitude, a scientist's uh, tenure uh, would be short-lived. Uh, an example. During the Carter administration, the White House staff wanted, this is the two cultures, the White House staff wanted the president to commit to a national goal that by the year 2000, the United States would draw 20% of its energy from renewable energy, rather than from hydrocarbons and nuclear. This was, you know, everybody wanted to duplicate Kennedy when he said, I want to have a man on the moon in, in 10 years. And so every president wants to do something like that. Uh, our, our previous president wanted to send a man to Mars, for example, but he never funded it. <clears throat> Well, uh, <clears throat> they argued on this, for this initiative uh, because they thought it was president, president was at a low point of his career and he needed something like this. <clears throat> so they, say, they came to me and said, Frank, we want you to join us. And I said, no, it's not possible. You can never do that by, by the year 2000. 20% of all energy from renewable resources can't be done. Uh, and it went to the president with my negative vote. <clears throat> uh, he, uh, 
despite what I've recommended, he went ahead and said, okay, I will agree with my political advices. I need this. <clears throat> so uh, he, uh, he, he overruled me. Now, he did this on several occasions, but he always sent me a note saying why he did it, much of the time saying he agreed with me, but there were political reasons where he had to move ahead. There was only one occasion in four years where I would have had to resign had the president decided to proceed in a certain direction. During the presidential election campaign of 1980, candidate Ronald Reagan announced that he believed in the biblical story of creation called creation science at the time. Reagan thought that creation science should be taught in schools together with a scientific theory of Darwinian evolution. Reporters immediately called me and, and said, hey Frank, what does your boss think about this? Well, the president asked me to work with his minister and draft a response for him to examine. I knew he was very religious, Pre President Carter, and, but also he was technically trained. <clears throat> I gave him a copy of my book, Understanding Earth, to read, and he read it in one weekend. It's, uh, he, 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 he was capable in this area. And so uh, I met with the minister and I said, I would like to write the first sentence. And I said, this is what I would like to say. The evidence that the Earth is four and a half billion years old and that life evolved over this period of time is incontrovertible. And the minister, to my great happiness, said, I agree. <clears throat> but he said, I want to write the second sentence. <laughs> and he said, I, speaking for the president, I believe that God is involved with a continual progress, pro the continual progress of evolution. I thought that was a pretty good deal. And so I said, that's great, let's do it. And the president did issue uh, a statement. He said this, my own personal faith leads me to believe that God is in control of the ongoing process of creation. Insofar as the school curriculum is concerned, school officials should exercise their responsibility in a manner consistent with the constitutional mandate of separation of church and state. I thought it was a great solution. Well, let me conclude at this point and we can take some questions. You can see that it's not easy for scientists and engineers to act in an advisory role. Nevertheless, despite the difficulties I've mentioned, I believe that scientists living in a democracy, one that supports them in their work and allows them the freedom to pursue their research, these scientists have an obligation to improve the functioning of their government and the welfare of the people by providing expert scientific advice and judgment when called upon. So to answer the question, can scientists provide useful and credible advice? I'd answer in the same way that I'd answer the question, how do porcupines make love? <laughs> With care. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>